Hello everyone and welcome to What If Disney World. I'm Stevie. And I'm Amy. Today we're going to complete our series where we discuss our typical park strategy for the four Disney World parks. And today we're discussing the big one, Magic Kingdom. If you've missed our other videos, we have Epcot, Animal Kingdom, and Hollywood Studios. So check those out. Yeah, we'll link those below. So we have been to Magic Kingdom a lot on both busy days and super slow days. I think it's really important, no matter what the crowd level is, though, to have a plan for how you will navigate the park. We typically stay on property, so specifically today we're going to talk about using our typical park strategy, utilizing early entry. If you don't know, early entry is a perk that allows on-site guests to enter the parks 30 minutes before official opening, getting a head start on rides and taking advantage of low wait times. Of note, in Magic Kingdom that's different though, only two lands are open during early entry, Fantasyland and Tomorrowland. Adventureland, Frontierland, and Liberty Square don't open until official park opening time. And of note too, Anybody can enter in Main Street and the main castle hub area early. It just you can't get back to Fantasyland or Tomorrowland unless you're a resort guest. And we also typically use Genie Plus, especially on busier crowd levels. But we've been in September, for example, on a party day and not needed Genie Plus. So it's really going to depend on the crowd level. But I'd say by far and large, Genie Plus is a good idea in Magic Kingdom. It's always been really helpful and it's relatively easy to use in Magic Kingdom because of how many rides and attractions are in the park. So on our typical trip, we actually like to spend two days at Magic Kingdom so we can ride everything without feeling too rushed or having time to enjoy things like the parade and the dapper dance and stage shows. And we tend to try and save our feet a little bit and stick to half the park on one day and half the park on the second day with some crossover, of course. Yeah, Magic Kingdom isn't a huge park like Epcot is, but we like to go in order as best as possible. So one day we tend to stick to Fantasyland and Tomorrowland, and then day two we explore Adventureland, Liberty Square, and Frontierland, and have time for parades and extras like the stage shows. It would truly be smarter to do one early entry in Fantasyland and one early entry in Tomorrowland and do the other half of the parks in the non-early entry time. But we have little kids that love the Fantasyland rides, Mm -hmm. and frankly, I love them too. And riding those twice during early entry is just what they want to do. So that's what we do. We use two early entry times in Fantasyland. So let's just jump in and talk about our day one strategy and what we typically do. So at 7 a.m., we try to snag a Tron virtual queue. If you don't get it at 7 a.m., don't fret. There's another opportunity at 1 p.m. if you are in the park, and that one doesn't tend to go as quickly. Or you can buy the individual lightning lane. Boarding groups and the virtual queue can be kind of tricky to get, but it is no additional cost, so that's a perk. But they will take you through the regular queue, which in our experience lasted about 45 minutes of wait time. The perk of the individual lightning lane is that it allows you to bypass the long line, but it is an extra cost per person above and beyond what Genie Plus is going to cost you. So you have to determine if that's important for your family and if it fits in your budget. The other perk about an individual lightning lane too is that you can choose your time that you want to ride. The virtual queue is going to be whatever time your boarding group is called. So that kind of leaves a little bit more uncertainty in your day. And the Tron boarding groups are very strict about the time. You have to go when your group is called or they'll turn you away if you're late. So just keep that in mind. And since we also usually use Genie Plus, quickly after we get the virtual queue for Tron, 
we choose our first Genie Plus ride, which I typically go with Peter Pan. That gets a super long wait during the day. So choosing that first is a good idea. Our biggest tip with Magic Kingdom is to arrive early. Okay, Amy, yeah, you said early entry, but what I mean is arrive even earlier. You don't arrive at early entry time. You arrive 30 minutes earlier than early entry time or an hour before the official park opening time because they will start allowing all guests into Magic Kingdom at that time. And you can stroll down Main Street. We also typically stop and take a picture at this point because we're not hot and sweaty and tired yet. We all look fresh and we get a really good picture. And then you follow the signs to make your way to the holding area for rope drop. Once they drop the rope and let people into Fantasyland, we typically do go straight to Seven Dwarfs Mine Train as long as we're up towards the front. If for some reason we're running late and we're towards the back of the crowd for early entry, you'll have quite a long wait. But as long as you're up towards the front, you can go for Seven Dwarfs Mine Train. It may be as few as just a few minutes wait, or it may be a little bit longer, but it's going to be one of the shortest waits of the day, so it's good to knock that out first. If you're not planning on using Genie Plus or you didn't get one for Peter Pan, I would recommend going to Peter Pan next, or if Seven Dwarfs Mine Train is down, which it commonly is during early entry, you have one of two choices. You could go to Space Mountain, or you could go to Peter Pan, and those would be good options too. What we typically do after we have ridden Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, since we have a Genie Plus Lightning Lane for Peter Pan, we then go and ride all the other Fantasyland rides during that early entry time. So this is Winnie the Pooh, Teacups, Dumbo, Barnstormer, and the Little Mermaid ride. And all of those typically are five to 10 minute waits or walk-ons this time of the morning. So you can knock them all out during early entry time. Depending on your Peter Pan lightning lane time, you may have to pop over and then come back to Ariel or something like that. But if you didn't have a long wait for Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, you'll probably be able to get all of these rides done before your Peter Pan Lightning Lane. Once you swipe in for the Peter Pan Lightning Lane, you can book your next Genie Plus Lightning Lane. So this is where a park strategy is really difficult to predict because it's going to depend on what you get next. I think good next choices would be to meet Ariel in her grotto. That's where you can meet Ariel as a mermaid with a mermaid tail or the princess meet and greets with Cinderella or Tiana and Rapunzel if you aren't doing a princess character meal. Depending on the return times that are listed, you may even want to go ahead and select Space Mountain. It just depends on what's available. And I'll go ahead and point out too, if you're waiting for your next lightning lane, PhilharMagic is a great 3D show that's a wonderful filler attraction to use between Genie Plus return times. Around this time, you might be starting to get kind of hungry, and so Gaston's Tavern is a great place to go get a snack. It has the best cinnamon roll I've ever had in my life, and LeFou's Brew, which is a frozen apple juice with marshmallow and passion fruit and mango mixed in, it's delicious. So we can typically, even on busy days, finish Fantasyland by around lunchtime, or we may have a thing or two to do after lunch. So this is even including It's a Small World and the Carousel if you want to do those as well. So let's talk about lunch options or meal options. We've eaten lunch at most of the restaurants in Magic Kingdom, and our personal favorite is Cinderella's Royal Table. If it's in your budget, I think that this is worth doing. We have a full review on that coming soon, so make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Be aware, it does take about one and a half hours, though, but it's a character meal where you get to meet five princesses, and it's a great midday break to take a rest, get some AC, fill up, and keep going. 
If you want something quicker or if Cinderella is not in your budget, then Casey's Corner hot dogs are really good. You can head back towards Main Street. It's a great view of the castle, and that's a good quick bite. When you get a Tron virtual queue in the morning, there is uncertainty about what time it would be called. Ours was called around 1.30, so after our lunch, we headed over to Tron. Like I mentioned earlier, it took us about 45 minutes of wait time to do, and we had to do rider switch, so we spent a lot of time in the afternoon in Tomorrowland. During waiting for rider switch, while Stevie and our oldest daughter were riding Tron and waiting in that 45-minute wait, I took the kids on Carousel of Progress and the People Mover, and that was a great way to keep them entertained and happy during that rider switch time. And then we spend the rest of the afternoon in Tomorrowland 2. Genie Plus priorities here would be Space Mountain and Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger Spin. Tomorrowland Speedway is a kid favorite, so we always do that, and we might even get Genie Plus for that later, depending on wait times. In our opinion, you could skip Astro Orbiter. It's a high weight and not really worth it. Monsters, Inc. Laugh Floor is pretty cute. It's kind of a plus or minus for us. It's a funny show where they tell jokes and interact with the audience, but we sometimes skip it. The Festival of Fantasy Parade, in our opinion, is something, though, to not be missed. It is a fantastic parade, and there's two times that it runs, 12 p.m. and 3 p.m., and it starts over in Frontierland, and it makes its way through the middle of Magic Kingdom and down Main Street. So if you're in Tomorrowland, pop over from Tomorrowland around 3 o'clock, You can stop and get some ice cream at the Plaza Ice Cream Shop and then catch a spot on Main Street to watch the parade. You will not regret it. And then you can head back to Tomorrowland and finish the rides there. Typically here, after finishing the rides in Tomorrowland, we are usually spent. The kids are usually tired. We may get like a dinner at Casey's Corner or we may leave and do dinner back at our resort depending on timing. Obviously, if you still have energy, you could keep going and you could do more and more rides through the evening. The fireworks show, too, in Magic Kingdom is absolutely phenomenal. If we stay at the Polynesian, what we typically do is watch it from there at the beach so we can go back, we can get dinner there or rest, we get the kids ready for bed, watch the fireworks, and then we're there for bed. But if you've never seen it from the park, it's really worth staying up for and seeing up close because the projections on the castle are so beautiful. And the timing of this show varies through the year based on sunset time, but it's usually between 8 o'clock and 9.30, And it gets pretty crowded, but depending on the crowd levels, you can probably get a spot 30 to 45 minutes before the fireworks, get some popcorn and enjoy. Just know that getting out of the park after fireworks is going to be very crowded. So if you are waiting on a bus or if you're even trying to get on the monorail, there might be a really long wait to get out of the park. A lot of people after the fireworks, though, go back into the park and ride some rides. If you have the energy for that, go for it, because then you can kind of avoid the rush of people trying to get out of the park. Okay, so now on to day two of Magic Kingdom. On day two, wake up, get Genie Plus, and I go for Jungle Cruise on this day, since we're going to be hanging out in that half of the park. But you remember, those lands aren't open for early entry. So we still arrive early because we love early entry time, love the low crowds. So we head back to Fantasyland and we rewrite any favorites. We tend to kind of let the kids guide this second early entry day. Like last time we went and rope dropped the carousel because that's what they wanted to do. And it was super fun and it created good memories. We just kind of let them do whatever they want to do and don't worry about a typical strategy until it gets close to the second rope drop time, which would be the official park opening time. So if you head 
past Peter Pan and It's a Small World and past the Rapunzel bathrooms, there's another rope that will be held there until official park opening time. And then they drop that rope to allow you to enter Liberty Square and head over towards Adventureland and Frontierland. So we head there and we go and hop on Haunted Mansion. It should not be hardly any wait at that point in the day since you're right there. You'll be one of the first people there. And then depending on your Genie Plus return time for Jungle Cruise, you may be able to hop on another ride before that like Pirates of the Caribbean or it might be time for your Jungle Cruise return time. After you've scanned in for your Jungle Cruise Lightning Lane, you can select your next Lightning Lane, which I would typically go for Big Thunder Mountain. Once Tiana's Bayou Adventure opens up, hopefully late 2024 is the projection, that will really change strategy, and we would definitely probably go for that first with Genie Plus, unless it's an individual Lightning Lane. We'll have to figure that out at that point and maybe make a new strategy video then. After you've ridden Thunder Mountain, you could select a Genie Plus either for Pirates if you haven't done that or the Mickey meet and greet on Main Street. That would be another good option. Our other favorites in this area of the park would be the Aladdin and Jasmine meet and greet. I enjoy the Tiki Room and our kids really love the flying carpets. And the must get snack, in our opinion, on this side of the park is a Dole Whip at Aloha Isle. The Tropical Serenade is also here now, which is coconut soft serve with the Pog Juice, pineapple orange guava juice. That is my new favorite snack in Magic Kingdom, so definitely check that out too. And our pro tip, because there's not a lot of seating around Aloha Isle, get your Dole Whip and make a short little walk over to Tortuga Tavern There's covered seating, and there's really nice bathrooms back there, too. Another must-get snack in Adventureland is the cheeseburger spring rolls. They are so delicious and so good if you want a savory snack. And while I'm on the topic of food, a good table service restaurant over on this part of the park is the Skipper Canteen. It's unique and really fun. We have a full review on that if you want to check that out. But there's also some good quick service places over here like Sleepy Hollow that has waffles. Columbia Harbor House has seafood and Pecos Bills has Mexican food. You really can't go wrong with any of those places. Things on this side of the park that are kind of plus or minus for us is Tom Sawyer Island, Country Bear Jamboree, Hall of Presidents, the Swiss Family Treehouse, and the Liberty Bell. If you have time to do them, do them. If you don't, don't sweat it. You can probably finish those things that I talked about wanting to do in the morning or at least by the early afternoon. And then in the afternoon, you have time to Rewrite some favorites, maybe see the parade again, catch a stage show in front of the castle, see the Dapper Dan sing on Main Street, go shopping at the Emporium, and just enjoy the atmosphere of Magic Kingdom. And this is also a great time to take a train ride around the Magic Kingdom. I mentioned earlier you could get a lightning lane for the Mickey meet and greet towards the front of the park. So we like to do that kind of as we're wrapping up and heading out or as we're hanging around Main Street, going in the Emporium, watching the Dapper Dans, that Mickey meet and greet is there towards the park entrance. So there's kind of our two-day park strategy, kind of general plan for Magic Kingdom. If you only have one day in Magic Kingdom, you'll just have to prioritize to you whatever sounds the best and pick and choose. Unless it's a super low crowd day, just have the mindset that you're not going to be able to do absolutely everything, but that'll just give you a reason to plan another trip, so it's all good. Our absolute favorites and must-dos would be Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, All the classics in Fantasyland, like the teacups and Dumbo, because that's just quintessential Disney World. 
The Little Mermaid and Winnie the Pooh are favorites of the kids. In Liberty Square, we love Haunted Mansion. And in Frontierland, Big Thunder Mountain. Adventureland must-dos would be Jungle Cruise and Pirates. And in Tomorrowland, Space Mountain, Tron, and People Mover. And then outside of those lands, the parade is an absolute must-do, must-see for us as well. Well, there you have it. That's our park strategy for Magic Kingdom. We hope you enjoy this content. If you do, make sure to like and subscribe. We have more tips, reviews, and, and Disney World content coming your way. Be sure to check out our other park strategy videos. And until next time, keep dreaming. Thank you.